All right, so we've got a lot of teams um, demoing today, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the intro slides. I just wanted to say um, welcome to a few new folks. So Dimitri is a JavaScript developer new on Spitfire for the last two sprints. We also have on Concord, Jen Colt is the new product owner. And then we also have a, a brand new team. Uh, they've been formed, I guess, for a little while now, um, but first time on the slides here. Um, Falcon is the team that's working on um, Elasticsearch. So welcome to everybody. And slideshow mode. Yes, I will indeed go into slideshow mode. Um, but actually, there's not much more to say here um, because I want to turn it over to the presenters. <clears throat> and um, the first team presenting today is Thunderjet with Alexi and then Andre. So that's actually all I have to share. I'll stop sharing and hand it over. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, Dennis can help me. So basically sure. what we are going to show you today uh, is a uh, fiscal year rollover thing. Uh, it's uh, a big feature, but we started to work on that and here's the first results. Uh, basically, I can show you that we have a new permission, uh, finance execute fiscal year rollover and users uh, that have their permission uh, will observe uh, a new function on uh, ledgers uh, list. If you select ledger, under the action rollover. Uh, and we uh, got to the new screen, rollover main library. I think Dennis can uh, describe better uh, that screen. Essentially what we're doing here is uh, setting up your settings for your fiscal year rollover. So we've implemented the majority of the front end uh, for this fiscal year rollover functionality. So here's where, where you're confirming basically on the left-hand side of the top, what fiscal year you're currently in, what the current period of that fiscal year is and selecting the fiscal year that you're going to roll over to. And it has to be one from the series that you're in. And there are more details on that, but the alpha here, so FY represents the series. Uh, so we'd be rolling over to probably fiscal year 2021. We might need to create that fiscal year, which we can do from here by clicking new fiscal year. Uh, <clears throat> so we could go through and we could create fiscal year 2021. This is the year we want to move to, make sure that our dates are correct. And when we save and close, uh, it's going to add that to the, to the, fiscal year box. So we know that we're going from fiscal year 2020 to 2021. And then the next sort of portion of things you see rollover budgets deals with setting up your budgets for this upcoming fiscal year, if you haven't created budgets already. And we see the budgets all grouped by fund type. So there's only one fund type showing up here, monographs. So we're assuming that all of our funds uh, fall under the monographs type. So we can control based on fund type. And then the last series of settings that you see uh, deals with creating encumbrances for our orders in this upcoming fiscal year. And we can decide whether we want to encumber or re-encumber all ongoing orders, ongoing order subscriptions, and one-time orders separately. And we can adjust the settings of how we want to roll over those encumbrances independently as well. So we would set those settings and click roll over. And for those of you who might want to play around with this in testing, just note that uh, clicking roll over is not actually going to do anything at this point because we're still working on the back end portion of this. But you can go to a ledger and click roll over and start manipulating uh, rollover settings. And I think that's about it. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, right now we are working on improving the screen and uh, actual rollover function. So let me get back. Uh, uh, 
to another feature, uh, actually, it's uh, uh, inventory thing and the tags. Uh, so basically, they were introduced to instances, holdings, and items. Uh, by the items, I mean, uh, I've created tag test demo tag, and uh, we can filter items by uh, that tag. Uh, actually, holdings will not be included, uh, and the same for instances. So uh, if we look for uh, that item, uh, we can open it, uh, and uh, in case we have tags, we have tags accordion open. Uh, basically the same thing for uh, holdings. We can uh, look at holding and uh, new tags accordion. So it's empty, but input test holding tag and uh, uh, search holdings by the tag. Uh, yeah, for instance, uh, there is uh, an another thing. Um, we have a similar uh, uh, fourth uh, layout pane and uh, with text. So we just can sign it from there. And, and the same for for filter. Uh, that's it from my side. I think Andre can continue. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Alexei. Let me share my screen. I believe you can see it. Yep, so, that's good. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, log total amount logic in invoices. Uh, and uh, firstly, we need to go to invoice form. And uh, here we are. And under the invoice information accordion, we can see a new fields like uh, log, log total and log total amount. Uh, by default, uh, log total is unchecked and uh, log total amount is uh, read only. And uh, if we hover on it, uh, we can see the tooltip says that uh, we need to check uh, total log total to interact with this field. Uh, let's do it. So since uh, we checked uh, log total, log total amount um, became uh, editable and uh, required. And uh, it's uh, add uh, the possibility to user to add a manual uh, total amount. So let's do this and uh, save it. And uh, we can see that uh, near the calculated total amount uh, appeared a new one. It's log total amount that we set previously and um, I want to mention that uh, calculated total amount is based on uh, totals of uh, invoice lines and its adjustments and uh, log total it's uh, the uh, to amount that a user can add manually so uh, for successful approving uh, these um, amounts uh, must be equal if we can try to approve with different numbers so we can see that errors that uh, invoice can be approved if we change log total amount that is equal to calculated total and save it and then approve so we can see that uh, invoice has been approved successfully. And if we go back uh, to edit screen, we'll see that uh, log total and log total amount uh, uh, become uh, uh, non-interactive fields. And uh, I think that's it from my side. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, Andre. Thanks guys.
Okay, great. So um, ERM team is up next with Owen to start out. Hey, um, just share my screen. Uh, hopefully you can see a slide on there. Yep. Yeah, okay. So just a really quick introduction from me. The, we're going to talk about um, the a requirement and how we've implemented it. And the requirement was in relation to supporting um, the modification of URLs, which we store in the agreements in all knowledge base. So we store this data, an external data store. So we're harvesting that into uh, the agreements app. But um, when the tenant or they want to uh, interact with those URLs, sometimes they need permission uh, to work successfully. And that can be the addition of proxy server settings, which allows the institution to go through a local proxy for authentication to get authenticated access to the resource. Or it can be for some other reason, like adding a, a code or institutional code into the URL or a uh, a special code that, that's required by the vendor of that e-resource. So um, that was the, the user requirements, um, that it should be possible to modify these things. And this is kind of en masse. Um, so in terms of implementation, uh, we knew we wanted uh, something that was very flexible because different proxy server solutions, different content providers, require you to modify URLs in different ways. So there is not kind of one standard set of changes that you might make, um, but we wanted to make it easy to make the most common changes, which are things like uh, percent encoding URLs. So when they get passed to a proxy server, they're, they're not misinterpreted or inserting strings into a URL uh, to add in uh, institutional code or a platform code. Uh, so we wanted those to be straightforward while having the flexibility. Um, we know that this isn't a daily task, so it's something that will probably be done by users with a medium level of technical skill. So uh, they'll have knowledge and they'll have some technical expertise. Um, we also needed these modifications to be able to apply at the level of a platform that is a, an online destination um, for, uh, for the, the host for resources so that all the resources uh, in one place online one domain or, or whatever would follow the same rules and we also knew we wanted to be able to do this across all urls so a proxy server <coughs> uh, implementation typically applies to all urls in the knowledge base although you may have some exceptions so actually i haven't mentioned on this slide but also the need to be able to kind of exempt some the kind of knowledge base wide rules applied. So that was kind of the, the user dri driven requirements and the implementation requirements. And I'll pass over to Ethan so he can share how we actually went about that. Uh, cheers, Owen. I'm just going to uh, check if I share this screen. Can you see Folio over here on the left and Postman on the right? So I'm going to just talk a little bit about the approach and then demo how this actually works before finishing talking up about uh, sort of a little bit of background about how this works. So as an approach, as I mentioned, we wanted this to be really flexible. Um, specifically, uh, both templating and uh, sorry, customizing and proxying are essentially the same um, from a backend perspective. It's taking in a string, applying the user-defined rule, and then outputting another string. So we wanted something that was quite lightweight, but also capable of performing both of those um, slightly differently with different contexts uh, and also allowing this to be extensible uh, to add more operations later or uh, even potentially reusing some of this code for another purpose down the road. Uh, to that extent, we ended up um, going with handlebars within mod agreements itself. Uh, and the main uh, driver really was that we wanted this to be decoupled from our domain model. Uh, this touches a lot of different parts of our domain model. Uh, any changes to platforms or PTIs uh, could trigger uh, changes here. And it would be quite fragile if we intertwine them 
So we were hoping to have something where we could make changes to the templating in future or to the domain model without uh, interfering with the way they interact. So uh, without much further ado, I'm going to show you how that actually uh, surfaces in the UI. Um, if you go to the settings local KB admin app and to proxy service settings, uh, you'll have the ability to add one and fields to add a name for it. The customization code is your rule uh, and then some platforms to exclude. So I've got a rule over here to the side that I'm just going to uh, copy in. Uh, and I'm going to call this proxy one. Oops. Uh, and for now, I'm going to exclude Taylor Francis. But as Owen mentioned, proxies are supposed to apply to everything um, with a few exceptions. So uh, I'm going to exclude Taylor Francis for this demo. Uh, so as you see, that, that uh, shows up. And I'm also going to add a customizer. And you do that by going to agreements the platform and here I'm going to add one to DeGroyter Online. So you go into this accordion, platform URL customization settings and add one. Right. So it's much the same, but with the absence of the platforms list, uh, that's because this is the platform. Uh, so it's stored in much the same way, but uh, you don't need to add it manually. And just worth noting uh, here, this is a good example of how we can use the hand of our syntax, uh, syntax to nest rules. So this is nonsense, but essentially it's going to add a hash before and after every A and also remove the protocol from an input URL, as well as make use of the platform local code, which having said that, I'm going to add one to DeGroyter just so that we can make use of that, like so. So with that done, I'm going to head over here um, and kick off that uh, templating. This uh, can be done manually through this endpoint, um, but we also have a timer task that will run every couple of minutes or so um, to keep this up to date. I'll talk a bit more about that later, um, but for the purpose of this demo, I'm kicking it off manually. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting to have a quick look. This is uh, a call to actually see those objects from our back end. And you'll notice that, as you'd expect, they have the rule, the name, and this ID scopes is that list of platforms you saw. But we also have this idea of a context, which drives the behavior um, that these string templates actually exhibit. So for example, for the proxier, this list of platforms is treated as a deny list. Don't perform this proxier for these uh, platforms. And for the customizers, it's treated as an allow list. So that's one example of how uh, the context drives behavior. And there's another example in a little bit, but uh, I'm actually going to fetch some PTIs now from both De Gruyter and Taylor Francis. And on De Gruyter, you'll notice that there's this templated URL set. Um, and we see both the proxy and the customizer uh, showing up as customized and proxied URLs, respectively. And they have uh, worked. You see the prefix and the encoded URL here. And here you can see the hash before and after the A. Uh, we also harvest the default URL, just so that this is a comprehensive list of all the URLs for this PTI. But also, um, you can see that the customized URL has also been proxied. Um, and that's another example of how uh, the context allows us to sort of uh, have hierarchical information stored um, in these string templates as well. Uh, so De Gruyter PTIs will have four um, template URLs. And on the flip side, um, Taylor Francis just has the default URL here um, because we excluded it from the proxier and it wasn't included on the uh, customizer. So with that uh, done, I'm going to talk a tiny bit about the challenges and approach in as sort of general way. I know we're a bit pressed for time. So in terms of the main challenges for this, we originally wanted this information to be done transiently um, and access uh, this as you render the, the PTI. But as a consequence of this being uh, as decoupled as possible, that means accessing uh, other domain objects and uh, services at render time, which uh, is becoming more and more seen as, as bad practice. And Grails 3 makes it quite difficult to do that. Grails 4 makes it nigh on impossible. So uh, what we've ended up with instead is a cache that we aim to keep updated as, as often as possible. And that's what that uh, templating endpoint will, will do. It'll update that cache. So with that, we want something that's both performant, but also reliable. And there's a bit of a trade-off there. Originally, we wrapped every single PTI update in a transaction, 
which meant that it was very robust. If even a single PTI failed, it would still run for everything else and, and work uh, just fine. But that was taking on the order of 20 to 30 minutes per 5,000 PTIs. Um, so what we ended up doing was using transactions a bit more sparingly and thoughtfully. Um, and we end up with something that will still, uh, it will only roll back per platform, which given most of these are living at sort of the platform level anyway, uh, makes sense. But also this allows us to update 5,000 PTIs. In our testing, 5,000 PTIs would update in about 20 seconds, which far outpaces the ingest. Um, and it, it means we can have a much lower limit of how up to date this cache will be. Not to mention the fact that because it's in a cache, um, it will just be there. The data will be there on an export by default um, and exposed at any time you make a call for a PTI. So it will be very easy to expose that in the UI, although we don't do that quite yet. So finally, uh, I just wanted to talk a tiny bit about how this works in the back end. I'll be as generic as possible. Um, but when that endpoint is called, the first thing that happens is it checks for any string templates, platforms, or PTIs that have changed since the last time it was called using a, a moving cursor. And if a string template is called, um, again, because this is super decoupled, it doesn't necessarily know which PTIs uh, have uh, are re that's relevant for. So it will attempt to refresh the whole system. Whereas if platforms or PTIs have changed, it will uh, do them um, in isolation. Uh, there is, at the minute, just to manage that queue a bit, um, there is a potential for double work. But we estimate that, as Owen said, this wouldn't be happening very much on a day-to-day -day use. And certainly between two-minute runs, you wouldn't expect much difference. So any possibility of double work is is fairly low. And as it's so performant, it, it's unlikely to make a difference. But there is room for improvement there. So when it actually runs a refresh, if it's running it for the whole system, it will first run it for every platform. And for each platform, it will run it for every PTI. So focusing on just what happens for PTI, it will compare the existed, uh, the existing cached list against uh, the templates that it performs. If they differ, it will replace them. And otherwise, it will just discard and move on. This is to cut down on a bit of the churn, um, database churn on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so I think that's all I had to say. I, I appreciate I went quite fast. Um, there was quite a bit to get in, but uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm willing to answer them on, on Slack or, or here if we have time. But uh, yeah, I think that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ethan. Um, yeah, I see there's some, some conversation happening in chat here. So I can continue that there and move on to the next team. Um, it's Stripes Force with Rasmus. Hello, let me just share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, so I'm just gonna present a little feature we added to UI users, which is the um, column selection. So now, if you click in the in the top right corner on the actions button, you would uh, be able to um, turn off some of these columns. So you can, so you only see what what you need to see in this list. And um, these uh, this selection will be uh, persisted in the in the session. So that means that you can uh, navigate around, refresh the page, and so on. And uh, the your column selection will be uh, persisted and and preserved. Um, this is only uh, persisted on this on the session. So next time you log in, it will be cleared for now. But the the hope is that in the future we will store these um, selections on the user itself, so that anywhere you will log in, it will save your settings. But uh, for now, it will just save in the session. And um, this is a design pattern or a UX pattern that we are going to uh, implement into um, uh, most modules that includes these uh, uh, lists um, in the future. So yeah, we started out by building it for UI users to see if it if it works. So you can go go ahead, check it out, um, give us some feedback if you think something should be different, and um, hopefully soon we'll we'll start adding it to to the remaining modules. 
So um, yeah, that's that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Rasmus. Yeah, that looks amazing. Core Functional has already pointed a story to add it to inventory. So people are eager to make use of it. Great. Okay, so next up is Thor with Mike Taylor. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes. Lovely. So um, you'll remember, those of you who were at the last demo, uh, we showed you the Z3950 server. And one of the questions that came up at that point is whether it has multi-tenant support, and the answer was no. Uh, now somebody should ask me the same question again, and I'll say yes. So I just want to show you a little bit of how that works. Uh, first of all, here's a little script I use to start the server. And you can see all it's doing is setting up a bunch of passwords in the environment so they don't need to be hardwired into the configuration file. And that top level of the configuration is nominated here on the command line. And I'll show you that config file shortly. Uh, so I'm going to run the non-censored version of this that has the actual passwords in. Um, and now what we have is that before, you may recall when we connected to the server, it made no difference what the database name was, but now the database name is used to select one of several configured databases that the Z server um, provides. Uh, and typically there will be one per tenant, but there's uh, more flexibility than that if you want it. And again, I'll show you how that works. So uh, we can see, for example, um, that we get different results now if we search for water 124 hits in the index data test database. Uh, but if I look in the Chicago test database, do the same search, I'll get a different number of hits because I'm searching in a different database. Uh, now, how is that done? I would like to briefly show you the configuration. You can see here now um, in the configuration directory, there's a whole bunch of, of config JSON files rather than the single one that we had before. Now that single one is still there. And this contains a sort of a base configuration that's used essentially for everything. And you can see it sets up a default index map, which if you're a, a Z3950 user of old, you'll recognize uh, these BIB1 use attribute numbers. Like our old friend seven says how to search for ISBNs and 21 says how to search both subjects. And there's some other stuff in there, which is all generic and contains nothing to do with how to connect to the backend folio service which used to be in this file. So what happens instead now is when you open um, a particular database, then the configuration file for that database is also used. Here's the index data one, and I'll show you what's in there. And you can see that it's essentially only the connection details. So the URL and tenancy use row copy and the corresponding username and password. And by the way, you'll notice here, uh, this is using the environment variable that we set in that start script. So that's how we keep this sensitive information out of configuration files uh, that are committed to version control and generally visible. Uh, so that's the index data one, uh, and that's perfectly straightforward. Uh, in a moment, I want to show you the Chicago configuration file, but first I want to show you one of the effects that we get from it. Uh, let's go back to searching in the index data database. And now if we do a, an ISBN search, remember bib one use attribute seven, uh, as every good librarian should know, searches for ISBNs. Uh, and what we find, if we look down here in the, um, the trace window that shows us what the Z server is doing, you can see that it's configured to use this rather opaque looking uh, UUID that, oh, okay, this is how we specify that we want the search not just to be for an identifier, which is what it says here, but specifically for an ISBN. And in Folio, the ISBN identifier type is hardwired to be represented by 826104F. Well, you can read the rest yourself. Uh, and it happens that for, for reasons that we're trying to get to the bottom of and, and sort out, the Chicago test database was set up to use a different uh, ISBN, uh, a different UUID to represent ISBNs. So if I now shift to search in the Chicago database and run the same search, what you'll see down here in the trace window is that it's using a different UUID. How is this done, you may ask? Well, I'll show you. Over here, back in the configuration files, let's look at the, uh, the Chicago one. And you can see that as well as having 
the Okapi and login stanzas that specify how to connect. There's also this override for the index map, which says that when we're running only against when we're running against the Chicago database, the definition of this use attribute seven ISBN is modified to be to use this CF zero A UID instead. So it gives us a way of encapsulating oddities of backend databases or of local preferences. So for example, if we have uh, one particular customer who prefers that a, a title search should include a different set of fields from the ones that are uh, configured here by default, then that kind of thing can go in here in this uh, tenant level database. Well, I shouldn't really call them tenant level. I mean, as I said, usually there's one of these per tenant. There's no reason that you couldn't have multiple setups on the same tenant if you wanted to. But there's one further uh, bit of configuration that we can provide here. Now, for one of our customers, and in fact, it turns out to be Chicago again, uh, let's start against this database. They use an application called Able Bindery, which has some limitations in uh, what kinds of data it can accept from the Z3950 server. For example, it, it becomes unhappy if it runs across titles that have accents in them. Um, so what we needed to do is provide a way of applying a sequence of filters to output uh, that will make it uh, available and usable for ABLE or more generally for any other kind of consuming software that has uh, similar kinds of oddities. So the way we've done that is, is with yet another configuration file. So I'm going to show you this uh, running first. Uh, if I search for a French word then I'll get back a uh, result. Uh, I'm showing you it's in the wrong order here. But our old friend, the $245 A field, uh, again, as all librarians know, is the title. And you'll see that there are no accents here in, the, uh, in this French phrase. But if I had been using the database name just Chicago, rather than Chicago filter able, let me do the same search again and show you the record again. And you'll see that it's the same record, but this time unfiltered. So now our two four five dollar A field has its accents in in the the usual way. How is this done? You ask me. Well, I'll show you. It's another configuration file. It's in exactly the same format as this top level configuration file that we showed you first, and the index data file and the Chicago file. They're all the same. This one for Able um, again provides uh, just information that's overlaid over the more basic configuration files. So none of this, this isn't used instead of the others, but because we access the Chicago database under the name Chicago filter symbol ABLE, this applies as well. So what we're seeing now is post-processing rules. Um, and you'll see that here we're saying these apply to mark records. In principle, we could do similar things for XML records, but at the moment the, the need for that hasn't been demonstrated. And what we have is uh, for each field that we're interested in transforming, we have an array of zero or more transformations. Uh, in this case, you can see we're working on the uh, field 0, 05, 0, 08, and our old friend 245 A. And that this one and only this one has an array uh, of more than one operation that runs. Uh, and what operations are they? Well, in theory, there's a, an arbitrary number of operations that we could support, but the two that we're interested in at this stage are strip diacritics, which we've seen in action, and that needs no additional information. But there's also a very powerful and general regular expression substitution operation. So this operates by finding things that match a pattern in the nominated field and replacing them, and it can do that using uh, various flags. In this case, we're using the G flag, which means a global replace. Um, and in this case, uh, the transformation, th these, by the way, are meaningless transformations, uh, rather like the ones that we saw on the URLs in the previous demo. These are proof of what can be done rather than examples of what you might actually want to do. But in this case, you can see the, uh, the pattern is it's searching for odd digits and it replaces those by this dollar one is a reference back to there. So each odd digit in the 008 field is replaced by that same digit in square brackets. Uh, and in fact, we can see the results of that. Well, I'll just rerun the search. Oh, beg your pardon, did the wrong thing there. 
Here we go. So up in the 005 field, you can see that uh, all the instances of one, two, or three in this number have been replaced by the string X slash Y. Why would you want to do that? Only to demonstrate the software. The more interesting case is here in the 008 field, you can see every odd digit, but not the even digits or numbers, has now had a, a pair of square brackets placed around it. So if you're familiar with regular expression substitutions, you'll know that there are, there are very few limits really on what you can achieve with them. And the idea is that uh, by having provided these facilities, we enable our customers to configure whatever transformations they want on the values of the fields that are retrieved from databases. And the last thing to say, though, I won't bother demonstrating it, is that um, you can see here that the database name I've given is Chicago filter symbol able. You can have any number of these. So I, if I write multiple uh, filter configurations, Chicago able, FUBU, they're all applied. And the last one listed wins in each case. So we're going from most general to most specific. And we can apply any sets of transformations. Uh, so that's how we're supporting multi-tenancy and uh, variant behavior within tenants in what's hopefully a very powerful and general way. Uh, all of this is documented on the um, GitHub repo that contains this software in the uh, config.md file. So you can look through and see uh, some of this should be familiar from before, uh, how you set up the index maps and so on, but also talks about the uh, available post-processing transformations and the way this configuration stacking is done with the more specific uh, terms overriding the more generic ones. So I think that's all that I had to show. I'll be very happy to take questions if there are any. Actually, I'll be happy to hear anyone's voice, so I know that I haven't just been talking. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> we heard you. Thank you, Mike. That was that does look really powerful. Thank you for sharing. And uh, people can ask questions in chat when, while we move on to the next sure. uh, demo. Okay, thank you, everybody. All right, thank you. Okay, Anne-Marie, you're up next with PolyJet. Okay, so we're going to show two things today. Um, Melodia is going to show some um, work that we've done to support the OCLC single record import that the index data folks are doing. Um, you're going to be able to trigger uh, the import of, of individual records to create new instances and mark records or to update existing instances and mark records. Uh, and that will happen, um, it'll be triggered from the UI, but it'll happen kind of behind the scenes. So Velodia is gonna show what those profiles do so that you'll be able to see that. And then Maria is going to show some changes that we've made to the um, uh, landing page and the view all page for um, the OCLC profiles and for the logs that are coming. And then uh, we've also made a, a little permission name change to make things um, clearer with the data import permissions that currently exist. So Velodia. Uh, yes, hello everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Can you see it? Yes. It's a little small. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, can you see it? Yes. Okay. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, so, we created uh, these two job default job profiles for OCLC. Uh, which I will be used for other guys. One of them is create instance section, and uh, the second one is for updating. So uh, we created uh, deta detailed uh, documentation with detailed guide for it. And uh, now I will go uh, through this guide where postman and show this request. So. 
uh, let's at first let's uh, create a specific job ex execution with uh, default create or COC instance. After that, let's update uh, job profile for this job execution. Yeah, after that, uh, the third step is to uh, start parsing uh, our record. Uh, this is a sample uh, like testing record with uh, specific data. So let's uh, start to upload it. And the last step is to finish this record processing. So uh, now let's uh, see this uh, newly created instance via data import in our uh, in inventory. And Belodia triggered this with Postman, but um, once the index data work is done, this will be triggered through an action button in inventory. Yeah. How to close this one? Oh, great. Uh, inventory. Yeah, so this is our newly created instance, which was created with uh, our random data uh, with specific fields. Yes, uh, so oh, after that, let's uh, using uh, update uh, OCLC default job profile. So there are two ways how to instance updates. The first one is via uh, instance, which was uh, created uh, via data import, how I created it uh, one minute ago. And the second way is uh, when instance was created via uh, inventory. So uh, we have uh, this uh, instance, uh, which was previously created with uh, via data import approach. So let's update it. And I want to mention that uh, we uh, now we have this field HCB and it will update when uh, we will use our update uh, job profile. So let's see how it work. Uh, it's the same uh, steps, but for default update instance. So we copy this job execution ID. and finish record processing. So everything is okay. And now we will update uh, this instance and it will update uh, this field, which I already mentioned. So you can see that now HCB updated. So uh, this way, which I show is for uh, we are data import approach. And now I want to show you uh, approach we are uh, inventory. So I uh, created this testing instance we are inventory. So it uh, has only this data and other fields are empty. Uh, this and these fields. So uh, now I will uh, update this instance via uh, some uh, specific data. So let's do it. So, so right have... now that instance has sources folio 
So yeah. that, that's an indicator. There's no mark record underneath it right now. Yeah, thank you, Marie. Uh, now uh, source is follow. Let's update it. The same uh, requests. Yeah, and finishing processing. Yeah, so uh, now let's update this page. Yeah, and you can see that uh, this instance was updated and now there are a lot of like random data in all fields. So I want to end that we, uh, in these cases, we matched by instance UUID, but there are a lot of opportunities to match via other fields. Uh, so that's all from my side. Feel free to ask some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Volodya. And Masha? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm sharing my screen. I hope you can see my browser now. Yes. Okay, so Valodia imported some files using the OCLC job profiles and I did some non-OCLC imports. Currently, I'm on the data import landing page. And as you can see, there are no OCLC imports here because we suppressed it from the landing page. But we can find it, uh, click on, on the view all button here. And here they are. So what's new here is uh, this inventory single record imports filter. And if I want to see only all CLC imports in my list, I can apply yes filter. If I want to see only non-all CLC imports, I can apply no filter. And if I like both of them or reset the filter, I'll see all logs for all records in the list. And one more thing I want to demonstrate is data import permissions. So I created a new user and I'm going to edit it and add some permissions. Let's search by data import. So we have two permissions for data import and we updated uh, UI labels for those permissions. So now it's more clear and described for users who want to assign permissions. And I want to mention that uh, this change didn't affect somehow uh, the users who already had assigned data input permissions. We just updated the UI labels for it. And I hope that's all I wanted to demonstrate today. If you have any questions, please ask. Thanks, Masha. And uh, the landing page suppressing the OCLC records um, the OCLC imports was a requirement from the users. If you had an acquisitions person doing, you know, 20 imports in the course of a day, um, those single record imports could really quickly overwhelm all the other import activity that was going on and, and really um, junk up the log. So we uh, are trying to keep the log on the landing page cleaner and just the, the regular data imports but giving access to all the OCLC ones if you need it on the view all page. All right, great. Well, thank you. That looks very good. And so next we have Magda um, and Concord. 
Hello, everyone. Um, it was another uh, busy um, sprints for Concord. We will uh, show just subset of what we have completed, but um, uh, we will show interesting things. Um, uh, we finished to uh, export. Uh, we finished work on exporting the mark records from SRS, uh, combined with the uh, holdings and items uh, information or data coming from inventory. The but front end we demonstrated uh, last uh, time. Uh, in the meantime, we completed the back end, and Ilya Boresenko will uh, present this today. Um, we also completed work, uh, the back end work for um, quick export, export of the inventory instances directly from um, inventory app. Uh, also, will be presented by Ilya. And the presentation uh, will end by. Uh, demo of the validation um, that we uh, introduced for mapping profile. The validation, data entry validation is occurring on uh, front and uh, back end levels. Uh, this part will be demoed by uh, Victor Soraka. Uh, Igor, are you, uh, Ilya, are you ready? Yeah, hi everyone. Let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. The first one feature that I'm going to present, it's new kind of mapping profile. It can be used to export records from source record storage and allow to append some holdings and item data from inventory to the final generated output. Uh, in case if no underlying SRS record is present, mark the record should be generated on the fly uh, by default mapping rules for instance fields and uh, with appended holdings and item data. So I'm going to show both cases. Uh, to run export, I'm going to use new created SRS profile that contains some holdings transformations. Uh, I'm going to export two records. The first one contains source mark and uh, some holdings and item appended data. And second one record, uh, has source folio and also contains some holding and item data. So let's run export. I'm using CSV file for it. And choose a service profile. So it's running. Okay, let's download generated MRC file and verify the content of it. Okay. And you can see this that this file contains two records. The first one, it's uh, underlying SRS record with appended holdings item fields. And uh, the second one, it's uh, folio a record from inventory that generated by default rules and also it contains appended holdings and items data. Okay, so that's all about uh, this new SRS profile. And the second one feature that I'm going to present is quick export. We created new endpoint in data export uh, so that allow to run it uh, or by uh, provide at least a few ADs uh, or we can use SQL criteria. So I'm going to uh, send request uh, to run data expert for uh, instance record uh, and default profile. Let's do it. Okay, let's check data expert. You can see that new uh, MRC file generated. Let's check it. Okay, and you can see it contains some uh, fields that generated by default profile. And the second one example is for SQL. So this criteria contains just in, uh, language, so it should uh, export all records that we have. Uh, let's do it. Okay. 
generated. Let's download. And you can see that it contains a lot of uh, record exported from data expert. So I think uh, that's all about my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ilya. Okay, uh, thank you, Ilya. Let me proceed uh, with my part. One second. So uh, do you see my screen, guys? Yes. Okay. Uh, so this is Victor from Concord, and um, I'm going to uh, show you uh, uh, several updates in uh, mapping profiles regarding the validation of transformation and updates in the transformation fields. For, and for that, I opened the uh, uh, mapping profile and uh, uh, clicked uh, edit transformation button. And here you can see that we have updated uh, the uh, transformation field in order to uh, stay consistent with uh, quick mark and data import applications. And for that, we split the one field, which is, uh, was behavior before, to force. Uh, and uh, now this one is for mark tag, uh, the, those two for indicators, and this is subfield. Uh, and in order to prevent uh, incorrect uh, data being provided to these fields, we also added uh, validations uh, validation for this uh, field. And uh, the rules are following that uh, for mark tag, uh, it should only contain three digits, and this uh, field is required. Uh, indicators can contain uh, only one digit uh, or uh, number or white space. And this field is actually is not uh, required. And subfield uh, is also optional, but uh, it should be, uh, in case the value is provided, it should start with dollar sign and contain either uh, one uh, uh, character or up to uh, two digits. And also for uh, record type of this instance, we allow uh, this uh, field to be empty uh, at all. So, and now I just want to show you uh, those two cases. And let me provide some values there. And for, the, for this subfield, I uh, want to provide uh, invalid value. So to show you the validation. And let me provide another one for instance. I just gonna uh, select as is to show you that uh, this field can be empty. And now uh, let's see on the selected ones. Also, I want to mention that uh, in case if we don't provide value there, uh, we uh, replace them under the hood with uh, empty spaces. So uh, the backend uh, will be, uh, will treat them uh, properly. So let me uh, save. And here you can see that uh, we append uh, this uh, uh, in uh, icon button. And uh, it uh, indicates that uh, there, there are some problems with, with these, uh, these transformations. And if we click on it, uh, we are going to see a general message for now, but we will be extending this uh, message with more uh, concrete uh, validation errors for uh, each field. And, uh, and in order to uh, pass this validation, I'm going to change the value to the correct one and hit save and close button again. And as you can see, it was successful. And now let me save it. And we see that the mapping profile was successfully saved. And uh, I just want to uh, mention that uh, the same, uh, the similar kind of validation was done from the backend side. Uh, so uh, in case someone, uh, hit, uh, try to create uh, these mapping profiles uh, through the API. Uh, we also ensure that uh, the proper data should be provided. So that's all from my side. Thank you. If you have any questions, uh, please ask them. Thank you, Victor. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Okay, so up next is core functional and um, Sergey has a quick demo today because the team has been working on um, back end for some big features that aren't quite ready to demo yet and 
um, to occupy the uh, the front end developers. Um, we've been doing a lot of bug fixing, 41 over the past two sprints. Um, but Sergey is going to show you a couple of the new features that we have as well. Over to you, Sergey. Thank you, Kate. Share my screen. I hope you can see it. We can. Oh, great. I'm going to show you a new feature that has been implemented and called uh, Patron Comments on Request. Let's create a new request on any item, uh, for example, on this. And after creating, you can see here the new uh, field, new text field under uh, patron comments uh, label uh, appeared. And after filling this, this field and filling the required other required fields, After saving, you can see that uh, this uh, comment appeared here in on the request detail page. Uh, when we return to the edit page, you may notice that, uh, uh, that this field is non-editable in edit mode. Uh, this was done so that uh, after the request was created to prevent patrons from uh, changing things after execution has begun and saying, for example, hey, I left something completely different in the comments and something like that. And uh, uh, if we try to uh, check in the item with this request, you can see that the page on comment uh, appeared in on the wait and pick up model. Also, uh, let's return to the request edit page. Uh, in the on the edit request page, uh, uh, separate hold shelf expiration time picker component has been added to already existing hold shelf expiration date. Uh, components so that uh, this uh, time component uh, uh, can be set on its own. And in addition to that, uh, the request CSV export report, sorry, I need to select uh, this report. Report now includes patron comments as well. Let's check it. This report, and you can see uh, the page on comments uh, column at the end of the table. Uh, next, some changes and improvements uh, have been created in the inventory application. First of them here in edit page. And here to maximize the readability of the text fields uh, in edit mode, all text elements uh, on the instance holdings and item edit page have been replaced uh, with, here you are, text areas. Also in the instance details pane in this statistical code section here. One column has been removed, another has been renamed, and now this section looks similar in the instance holdings and item details page. And uh, finally, in the settings, inventory, and the holding sources page, you can see that the entries with the source value as uh, can no longer be edited. 
However, we can edit and uh, delete a new record. with source other than follow. We can delete it. Yeah, so that's all I wanted to show you today. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask. Thanks, Sergey. great demo. Um, okay, we're making really good time. So we do indeed have time for our QA update from Anton. One second, let me share my screen. Um, it's this one. Okay, I have a few slides uh, to share with you today. Uh, so last week we um, uh, checked uh, the progress on RTL just um, uh, test migration status. So three teams so far made progress. Uh, Thunderjet and Concord have their modules integrated in Jenkins and reporting um, code coverage that you could see on, on the slide. Um, and Fiber team actually has all the old tests converted into RTL Jest, but not integrated into Jenkins. So we don't um, so we don't see them in Jenkins, and that needs to be done. Uh, needs to be uh, done soon. So moving on to the API integration tests. Um, we, uh, we changed the API integration test job so they are more obvious and um, kind of when you read uh, the job Jenkins job name, you um, you know what it means. So folio API test karate um, is, uh, uh, is available. so you guys you can contribute your tests to the uh, corresponding repo for that job. As you can see, there are some tests for acquisitions, data import, folio, uh, mod data export, OIP image, um, quick mark. So um, uh, please include this, um, into, uh, this test into your definition of done and start contributing to that job uh, um, if you choose to use Karate. So we also will be working on um, implementing notifications that are corresponding to a particular module so that only team that is responsible for a test that fail will be notified. So it will not be broadcasted across all the teams, but that is a work in process. Pretty much same thing applies for the uh, Postman test. So the job is called Folio API Test Postman. Right now you can see that a bunch of them failing due to uh, wrong token. That issue will be fixed soon. And we're also planning to implement um, uh, uh, module specific notifications um, here as well. But that shouldn't stop you from uh, keep adding the tests to the, uh, to the repo and so that they will be included in, the jo uh, in this job and we'll get this job um, running uh, without failure soon. So that being said, guys, these two jobs will be required to pass in order for us to go into the next bug fest. So no fail test should be, um, uh, uh, no failure of a single test uh, should exist before we go into next bug fest, so please, Pay attention to those to those jobs, and both of them are running in the uh, reference environment. So this is jobs that running post uh, pull request. And the last uh, slide I have, this is uh, kind of food for thought. I know that you're all busy with working on function uh, new functionality, and release cycle is short this time, so. 
there's a lot of things to do. Uh, however, I want to get you on on your ra radar so you will not be surprised uh, uh, when we ask you to actually do that in the near future. So we have to reduce AWS costs by shutting down most of the reference uh, systems. And there is no need to be alarmed at the moment. It's all going to be done in the organized and safe fashion so that you will not be left stranded. However, we need to shift our thinking into you know, utilizing more of the scratch environments and shifting our testing into the scratch environments. So we're still going to run integration tests on a reference environment, but we're not going to support as many of those as we have now. We just can't have both scratch environments and uh, reference environments in the numbers that, that they exist right now. So uh, start thinking about how to complete story accept acceptance testing within scratch environments before pull request and not and avoid doing this in the reference environment. So reference environments, uh, we're gonna try use them only for the integration testing. So as of right now, I know that not a single team is using Scratch environment for UI testing, and that needs to change in the near future. So kind of direct your thoughts into how to enable that and if you blocked or need help, then reach out for help uh, to me. And I already compiling the list of uh, action items that resulted um, after the UI testing team meeting last week when we reviewed what's happening with the uh, UI test migration to RTL Jest. So each team should have pipelines in the community Jenkins. Uh, not in the Jenkins that exist in the ranch environment, but actually in our main Jenkins that will point to your scratch environments. And uh, DevOps will help you with that, but that's the plan so that you will have your own uh, um, uh, folder. Uh, each team should have the, the, uh, uh, your own folder where you can have all the pipelines that you need that you can execute against uh, your scratch environments. And also you need to think about how to enable PO to review your store completed stories in the scratch environment and iterate much quicker uh, through the scratch, uh, you know, uh, if something doesn't work for PO, then you can iterate much quicker within, within those scratch environments rather than waiting for the reference environment. Again, this is all just like, it's not the uh, ratificated law. It's just kind of coming in a theater near you um, advertisement or what needs to be kind of, I'm trying to create a shared uh, vision, what needs to happen in the near future. Uh, hopefully we'll make good progress for this release and then finish it down for the R2. So that's all I have for you, so, uh, and I think this comments, uh, what I'm saying now can generate a lot of questions. And I suggest uh, we could uh, take them offline and reach out directly to me, or we can set up uh, meetings where we can discuss this, um, this approach. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Anton. All right, so amazingly, we are done 15 minutes early. I really thank everyone for rushing through your demos. I thought it would be tighter than it was. Um, I don't know if there's anything anyone wanted to circle back on since we have a little bit of extra time. I guess not. Um, one last thing um, before we wrap up, just wanted to, let folks know, I think most um, or many know that um, this is my last week on the project. 
And um, so, you know, I'm rolling off um, Eva Betcher, who is the PO for loans and item states and circ log has left the project recently. So um, just want to make a shout out um, to the community. And I know not everybody's on the call right now, but folks listen um, later and, and watch the video on YouTube. Um, we are looking for um, POs. So the PO team has been awesome and they have stepped up to take over Emma and my responsibilities in the interim, um, some of them long-term. Um, for example, Holly Misselbauer is going to be the lead PO for Core Functional. Anne Marie is going to do the sprint reviews. Um, Charlotte, Cheryl, Aaron Nedefee from Duke has stepped up to take on um, uh, locations and service points. So people are really stepping up. But many of, much of this is really just for the interim because a lot of these POs were extremely busy as it is. And so we really are looking for more help. Um, we need at least one full-time equivalent PO that can be you know, full-time PO or two half-time POs. Um, and we're also still looking to fill the, um, the folio lead PO role um, requests as well. We don't have a, a backfill for request PO. So if anyone, is interested or knows of anyone, um, please reach out. And that's it. That's all I've got. I well, think we, we can can't end really go by, Kate, without saying thank you for everything that you've done, your experience, your, your wisdom uh, in shaping the project and uh, taking it as far as we have and setting us up for the future. Thank you very uh, much. Thank you so much, Peter. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I look forward to monitoring how the project does. I know it's destined for even greater things. All right, guys. Take Thanks, care. Kate. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.